So we've made it to part three. As you'll see, we're, we're getting more, um, we're trying to get more clinically, um, directly clinically relevant as the day moves forward, now that the basics are behind us. Um, the, next, um, the next break we'll take will be for lunch. And um, uh, you know, for those of you watching at home, I'll want you to also eat lunch at the same time. Um, the, uh, we're going to bring box lunches in to save time to try to keep the amount of time down. And you know, some of you might think, well, gee, if, maybe it'd be better if we like stretched this out over the course of a week and had a couple hours and thought about other stuff and and uh, you know didn't have this like intense even a short lunch break just to get it that much shorter. But uh, I I go by the advice my brother gave me when I was when I was little. He said. David, if you have to eat a turd, don't nibble on it. <clears throat> so, um, so with that, let's continue into the uh, <clears throat> into other optics of note. So we're going to specifically talk about magnification and telescopes uh, and tie that into low vision and mirrors, and then prisms as well. So um, magnification and telescopes. First, we'll talk about the types of magnification, simple magnifier, telescopes, and then um, the magnification effects of refractive correction and anisoconia that can result. So in magnification, there are three types we want to talk about. Transverse, which is a change in the height of the image. Axial, which is a magnification in depth along the axis, and then angular magnification, which is when we are viewing something with an eye or using a telescope <clears throat> or, uh, or loops. But transverse magnification brings us all the way back to our u plus d equals v, sort of the diagram that we were doing yesterday or whenever that was, last week. Or, I don't know. So um, no, it was this morning. That's right, because we're getting it all done today. Um, <clears throat> So it's just, so here's our, that picture I showed you where we have image and object and the central ray. And the magnification is the image height divided by the object height. But that we don't always know, but what we always know from these calculations is image distance divided by object distance. And that's the same, it's, that also gives us the magnification. So magnification is image distance over object distance. So in, in books you'll tend to see it as like a cursive U and a cursive V for the reciprocal of u and v. But I find that I start to get my reciprocals and cursives mixed up. So if you just say image distance over object distance and work it out that way, it's, I think, your safest bet. In the eye, too, we can look at transverse magnification. Again, remembering the 17 millimeters. Should be a, sorry, let me just uh, <clears throat> uh, edit this lecture. Uh, I, you know, you've heard of procrastinating. Um, and I'm actually working on my lecture while I'm giving it. <clears throat> oh, that's still wrong, 15.5. Fix that again. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so um, the uh, uh, 17 millimeters and then the central ray passing through the nodal point so we can figure out magnification of the eye. The problem is when you're starting to look at magnification of the eye, People have different axial lengths, and so it's not always going to be 17 millimeters. So this only applies in certain generalized cases. Axial magnification is magnification along the axis, and it turns out that it's the square of the transverse magnification between any two given conjugate points. So this is going to cause distortion in 3D images, because if here's the object, if the image height now is twice the object height, well, the image depth is going to be four times that, the square of two. And so you're going to get this distortion of uh, depth. And we'll get back, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Angular magnification is when we're looking at objects or images at infinity, because there, if image distance is infinity, image height is undefined. And so you can't do that ratio, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So when viewing with an eye, we have to find a different way. So that what we use is angular magnification. So if I'm looking at the moon, and say the moon takes up one degree of my visual field, and now I look at the moon through binoculars, 
and it now takes up, say, three degrees of my visual field, then that means those are three X binoculars because the angular uh, amount of the angle of my visual field it's taking up has gone up by three. So that's the basics of angular magnification. Now, when we're looking at something at the moon, that's simple. When we're looking at something up close, it can get a little bit more complicated with a hand magnifier. Because if I'm looking at, a, at say, an ant that's walking around on the, on the desktop here, um, it's going to look a certain size. If I now put a magnifying glass up there, it might look three times bigger than it was without the magnifying glass. But I can also make the ant look three times, take up three times more of my visual field just by moving closer or further away. So, we, so the comparison it doesn't apply because when you have the magnifying glass up there and it's parallel rays of light coming out, as you move closer and further, it doesn't change the angle as much. So what you need is a standard, basically. And so the standard for a hand magnifier is we say that it's the angle, the difference in the angle that it takes up compared with when there's no magnifier at a set reference distance of 25 centimeters. So if we use 25 centimeters then as our reference distance, as is shown here, and we want to know the difference between that and this, then we can do the math and it's theta, tangent, negative one, blah, 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 d over four. So the power of a hang magnifier is d over four. Um, <clears throat> so for example, if you're using a 20 diopter lens as a hand magnifier to look at the ant, it's 20 over four is five x. So the ant is going to look five times bigger through my magnifier than it would look if I took the lens away and positioned myself 25 centimeters from the object. Note that you could also describe that as d times 0 0.25 meters, that is d times the reference distance. And so if someone wants to change the reference distance to say 40 centimeters, it would just be d times 0.4 instead of d times 0.25. When we look at the eye through a direct ophthalmoscope, <clears throat> you may not realize this, but if you're emetropic and the patient's emetropic, there's no lens in there. All it is, it's a light source for you to look into the eye using the optics of the eye as a hand magnifier. The 60 diopter power of the front of the eye is essentially a hand magnifier. The power is then 60 diopters, D over 4 is 15x. So when you look at the optic disc through your direct ophthalmoscope, it's 15 times bigger than it would look compared with if you ripped the optic nerve out of the back of the eye and held it exactly 25 centimeters away. Now for telescopes, we're looking at things off in a distance. And so now it becomes less important at uh, the distance because if you're standing on your tiptoes or, or squatting on the ground, it's still basically infinite distance away. So you, so you no longer need a reference distance. What instead you have is you have parallel rays coming into a telescope and you need to then have parallel rays coming out. And in between those two lenses in an intermediate image plane. So basically, the light comes in parallel. Here's the lens. It now causes the rays to converge. And then they reach an image plane. Then they diverge again. Then a second lens changes them back to parallel rays of light. And this difference in focal lengths is like a lever that adds to the magnification of the image. And so the magnification is just the ratio of the focal lengths which, if you take reciprocals of each, is the power of the eyepiece divided by the power of the objective is the power of this astronomical telescope. The length of the telescope is the sum of the two uh, focal lengths. Now, Galileo had a better idea. Now, the, oh, the problem with the, the astronomical telescope is, you see, if you follow this ray, it goes from top to bottom, and this ray goes from bottom to top. And so the image is inverted. So Galileo had a better idea. Galileo said, oh, I know. I don't know if he said it that way. <clears throat> he said, um, if we take the same objective lens, but now before the rays of light have converged to form an image, we put a minus lens in the path and diverge it out. So we still have parallel rays of light coming out, parallel rays going in. And we still have these two focal lengths. We still have our lever effect. 
But now the telescope's going to be shorter because it's this, uh, because the uh, because the focal lengths overlap, and the image is going to be upright. So the magnification of a Galilean telescope is still power of the eyepiece over power of the objective. Same as with an astronomical, but it's an upright image, and the telescope is shorter. So most of our most of you who buy surgical loops will buy these Galilean telescope loops that then just have an extra add on the front. So that it, which is so, if you want to use it at a 33 centimeter working distance, you just put a plus three add on top of this Galilean telescope. So to summarize, if we have a plus 20 diopter lens used as a simple magnifier, it's going to be d over four or d times 0 0.25. It's going to be 5x angular magnification. If we use a minus 20 plus four telescope. It's 20 over 4 is 5x when the minus 20 lens is the eyepiece and the plus 4 is the objective. Um, if you were to turn those around, sorry, if you were to turn the telescope around backwards, it would be 1 fifth x minification. And a plus 20 plus 5 telescope is going to be 20 over 5 or 4x. The plus 20 plus 5 telescope, though, is going to be longer because the focal lengths overlap. The minus 20 plus 4 telescope is going to be shorter because the focal lengths overlap. The longer one, they don't overlap, they add. The plus 20 plus 5 is going to be an inverted image. The minus 20 plus 4 is going to be upright. Why do patients say that things look smaller when they're over minus during a refraction? Well, what happens is the, uh, you put too much minus in the trial frame. That's like the eyepiece of a Galilean telescope. Then the patient dials in plus power into their eye. They're accommodating. That's like putting more plus power all the way inside their eye. So they're viewing the world through a backwards Galilean telescope so that things appear to look smaller. And in general, when we talk about magnification in the eye, we have to do a, a little bit of a um, a mental exercise here to understand what it means to be aphakic in a different way than is maybe intuitive. And that is if we were to, to take uh, someone with an emetropia, no refractive error, and inserted a minus lens inside their eye, how would you correct that refractive error? You correct it with a plus lens. So we call it an error lens. So we're putting a minus lens inside of an, a normal eye to simulate refractive error. So that's inside of the eye with its lens still intact. Now we've got to correct that with a plus lens up front here. And what you see, what we have then is the minus lens is the error lens, the plus lens correct. Now this aphakic patient is viewing the world through a Galilean telescope. What's the magnification? Power of the eyepiece over power of the eyepiece over power of the objective, 12.5 over 10, or 1.25x. So 1.00x is no enlargement, so 1.25x is 25% enlargement. So an aphakic patient wearing spectacle lenses is going to have 25% enlargement of the image. If we instead correct that with an intraocular lens, like so, now here the aphakic lens is a plus 10, but the intraocular lens is going to be a plus 11.75 in this case. Now the Galilean telescope is 12.5 over 11.75, which is 1.06x, or only 6% enlarged. So a contact lens gives less magnification than a spectacle lens for the same refractive error. And an intraocular lens would be even less magnification. Even correcting refractive error with ordinary spectacle lenses does cause some magnification. And you kind of have an intuitive sense of that. If somebody's wearing plus lenses, their eyes look big. If they're wearing minus lenses, their eyes look smaller. And the number is 2% per diopter of power at the standard vertex distance. So you can calculate that then, because it can be a clinical problem of anisoconia. Anisoconia is when there's an image size difference between the eyes. We can tolerate 6 to 7% of different, usually in a, in a typical adult can tolerate that. Children can adapt to much larger degrees. So I have patients who have 10, you know, minus 10 or 12 in one eye and Plano in the other. I just give them the whole thing and, and um, eventually they learn to adapt. So here's a, an example of anisoconia. 
And this may become a clinical problem, for example, after cataract surgery, if you have a refractive surprise. So if the right lens is minus three diopters and the left lens is plus one diopter, then the right lens is gonna be 2% smaller, three times, I'm sorry, two, is gonna be three times two equals 6% smaller, whereas the left lens is gonna be one times two is 2% 2 larger, so the difference between eyes is gonna be 8% difference. And that's probably gonna to be too much for the patient to be able to tolerate. They may complain of double image or inability to fuse or something of that nature. So how would you fix that? Well, of course, you could give the patient a contact lens because then the, ref then the difference in magnification is less. If you wanted to completely obliterate any difference in image size, you would actually give the patient a, uh, for example, you could give the patient a minus four contact lens because then both spectacle lenses would be plus one. And then there'd be no magnification difference between eyes. So from magnification, we go to low vision, and we'll talk about the approach to the patient. Kestenbaum's rule, near aids and distance aids, emphasizing the near aids and non-optical approaches to correcting low vision. So in low vision, you know, generally the patient is going to have a lot of different needs, but it's they can't you really you can't address all of them in one sitting, so you have to do it in little bits. The most typical th thing that patients want is they want to be able to read better. So that's generally the first emphasis on a first visit with a low vision patient. Of course, the thing you need to know up front is what's their visual acuity, and they can't see that well. So you need to do, uh, you can either, uh, to, to get their best refraction in place. A lot of these patients have kind of been given up on by their doctors, and so the refraction isn't even right. Uh, once they couldn't help get them back to, to normal function. We want to know their visual acuity, so you can either use these low vision cards or simply move the patient closer to the eye chart, as we discussed. And then you have to be aware of the kinds of devices that are available to help patients. So what I want to talk about is plus lenses, loops, electronics displays, and non-optical aids for low vision. So but when we think about the patient who wants to read, though, one place to start is with Kestenbaum's rule, and it's used to estimate the strength of a plus lens that would be required to read newspaper print without accommodation. So to determine this, you measure the distance, Snellen, visual acuity, and guess what? Take a reciprocal. The resulting number is the required plus power to read. It's just a coincidence, a useful coincidence that can get you started. So a patient comes into your office, 20, uh, 2,400 visual acuity distance. What kind of a near ad do you estimate they're gonna need to be able to read newsprint? Well, it's 400 divided by 20 is 40 over two is 20. So they're gonna need like a plus 20 lens in order to be able to read newsprint. So you put the plus 20 lens up there and you give the patient the newspaper and they, and they hold the newspaper. They say, well, this doesn't help at all, I can't see. And that's because they're used to holding things at a normal reading distance. But take another reciprocal. It's a 20 diopter lens, so 1 over 20 is 0.05 meters or 5 centimeters away. So they're going to have to hold it up here to see, and now they'll be able to see it clearly. Now, this coincidence is useful. It's a good starting point, but you do actually have to put the glasses on the patient and see if that's what's best for them before prescribing it. So. Plus lenses for near are one of the key things that are used, and we can give high ads in a bifocal of plus four to 20 diopters. Uh, you can see that there is a, a problem with that, which is the close working distance, but it does leave both hands free and gives a wide field of view. That close working distance can give extra problems if a patient has binocular vision, because they basically have to converge. If their working distance is five centimeters, they've got to converge five centimeters in order to see. Well, they're gonna have a convergence insufficiency, so they're gonna need, so they're exotropic basically at near, so they're gonna need base-in prisms to help them be able to use the two eyes together. For patients who don't want that to be so limited to have to hold things five centimeters away, there's also handheld magnifiers. 
Handheld magnifiers allow for much greater variation in the eye to lens distance, so it's more comfortable for patients. However, it does require some degree of dexterity, and it's not as good for patients who have arthritis or tremor. Plus, there can be lighting issues. It's hard to get good light with the handheld magnifiers. There are lighted, uh, there, there, oh, so for the patients who have trouble with arthritis or are unsteady, then there are also stand magnifiers, which again allow for a variable distance from the eye to the lens. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, there can be more trouble. They're, they're less portable, and the lighting can still be an issue. So for that, there's all, there are lighted magnifiers, lighted hand magnifiers, which obviously give more vision. You can also, there's a little line in this one to help you find your place on the line. And you can get a, a decent amount of magnification. And there are whole varieties of these that are available for different patients. Everybody wants something a little bit Bit different and so it takes some time to work with patients to find these things. If so if we compare then plus lens nearing uh, uh, near aids the uh, high plus ad gives you a um, both hands free and a wider field of view but a shorter working distance. The handheld magnifiers give a variable eye to lens distance but it requires one hands and, and is more difficult for patients with tremor or arthritis. Uh, that's what I say here. The, um, the disadvantage is the smaller field of view. Handheld magnifiers are more portable. Stand magnifiers are more stable. For patients where that's not enough, there is also the op option of loops. Loops, you can get even higher magnifications. They're basically telescopes with a, with a focusing, with a near ad on them. So they give a longer working distance, you see here, and they leave the hands free. So, but, they're, but the depth of focus is limited, so it requires precise head position. You know this because you've used surgical loops. It's not necessarily that easy to get used to it. The field of view is smaller. They're going to be costly. And you know, patients, even elderly patients with low vision, they don't necessarily want to be this conspicuous and have something that looks like that. So then there are electronic displays that are used that can be used for reading. Uh, closed circuit television, you can see this requires some manual dexterity to move it around on the page, but it allows for reversal of contrast. They can be expensive, although this particular model, the patient got at a steep discount. Um, and then there are computer scanners where it's a scanner and a computer display that's, uh, that turns the uh, image on the page into something where you can get reverse contrast. You can even get it turned into uh, speech uh, if you have very low vision. Then there's also something, there are the handheld cameras that are perhaps more intuitive than the closed circuit where you're, instead of bringing the material under a camera, these handheld cameras allow you to point the camera at the area of interest uh, with a good depth of focus, so, so they're more intuitive. Um, <clears throat> so to summarize the electronic displays, they have very high magnification, allow for contrast reversal, and can, uh, eliminate extraneous material, but they're expensive, they're generally not portable, and they require a degree of dexterity. So then there are non-optical aids that can be used, uh, large numeral telephone dials, large print reading materials, uh, there are black ink marking pens just so the patient can see what they're writing, there are masking devices that can be used for reading, and then there are signature guides, and these are especially popular with the younger relatives of older low vision patients. Uh, just sign right here, Grandma. <laughs> and then just in general, helping patients control their illumination to get the right amount of light on the page to be able to see. All of these non-optical aids, they're generally low tech, but they're things that can make a big difference to low vision patients. For distance, the choices are much more limited. There are telescopes that patients can use. For example, the need might be to see the blackboard or to see a bus sign. 
Um, there can be monocular or binocular telescopes, handheld or spectacle mounted, and they can have adjustable focus or a fixed focus. These bioptic telescopes, they're built into glasses, but, they're, so for, but they allow for free navigation and hands to be held free. And the patient will just sort of tip their chin down when they need to see, uh, s to see something in particular, and then otherwise the magnification is up there because you can't really walk with looking through them or drive. But it is in some states, it's legal to drive with this sort of a low vision aid because the, if this lets you get 20-40 vision, as long as your peripheral vision is intact. And then absorptive lenses can help control glare, can help patients with, for example, achromatoxia and dark adaptation, um, and um, help with uh, media opacities or albinism. Again, a sort of a lower tech thing that makes a big difference to patients. The higher tech approaches, there are head-mounted video cameras out there, dual video monitors. You know, for some reason, this one just hasn't really caught on. And then there are implantable mini telescopes, which are in clinical trials now. Um, you know, we'll see how they go. I mean, it, to me, it almost makes as much sense to just leave a patient a fake. It can give them plus lenses, and then you get 25% magnification that way. Uh, but, uh, but we'll see. So that's low vision, and now we'll move on to mirrors. And we'll talk about the laws of reflection. We'll talk about the different types of mirrors that are out there. Uh, vergence calculations, so the U plus D equals V for mirrors, basically. And then look at real and virtual images created using mirrors. So the laws of reflection are straightforward. The angle, when light is reflected off some surface, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. So that the incident ray the normal to the surface and the reflected ray all lie in the same plane. All that says is light bouncing off a mirror isn't going to just change direction. Mirrors are just, are, can be considered a lens that flips over the image space by reversing the direction of light. A plane mirror adds no vergence, it just reverses direction. A convex mirror adds minus vergence, a concave mirror adds plus vergence, like a plus lens. And we can apply that formula from this morning or yesterday or last week, U plus D equals V, to locate the images formed by mirrors. All you have to do is remember that the mirror is reversing the direction at the same time that the vergence changes. So a plane mirror forms an erect virtual image of a real object. And the image is as far behind the mirror as the object is in front. So that one, one outcome of this is that actually you only need a half-length mirror to see your entire self in, because if you start at the foot, the light comes halfway up the mirror and then comes towards your eye. It, it depends on what kind of shoe style you wear, though, because if you wear those really long, pointy shoes, then, then you know, they're going to come closer, so then you'll, in order to see your shoes, you'd have a little more. But still, the basic idea is about a half of a mirror. The other thing that that means is that as you move a mirror farther away, the, the image also moves further away, so the field of view stays the same no matter how far away a plane mirror is. It's the size of the mirror that gives your field of view and not the distance away from the mirror. Now, Connie West took some pictures uh, of what it looks like in a, in a mirror to, to demonstrate some of these principles. So here's a plane mirror, and you see that as the mirror is further, in both cases she still has an upright image, and that as we get further away, the image, she, the image also moves further away, so the field of view doesn't actually change. Contrast this with what you see with a concave mirror here. In the concave mirror, the image is now inverted and minified somewhat when you're far away. But actually, when you're up close, the image is upright and magnified. And we'll do the calculations to show why that is. Then you can have an astigmatic, uh, a, a convex mirror. And in a convex mirror, again, the image is upright, and it's going to be minified, and that's what this says. It says objects in mirror are closer than they appear. That means they're, what does that mean? Uh, no, it means that they're minified. And then you can have an astigmatic mirror, as you see from this oil tanker, where it has a flat horizontal meridian, 
but a steep vertical meridian, so you get different ref reflecting powers and therefore different sizes in the two different dimensions. So let's do some vergence calculations to show that we can do that with a mirror. And first, we just want to demonstrate that the image is as far behind as, as the object is in front. So we have an object that's 25 centimeters away from a mirror. Where's the image? Well, 25 centimeters away, we take a reciprocal, 1 over 0 0.25 meters. Don't forget to convert. 1 over 0 0.25 meters is negative, is 4 diopters, but it's negative 4 because it's diverging light. So then u plus d equals v, negative 4 plus 0 vergence added by a plane mirror equals negative 4. But the light has reversed directions. So it's going this way with a vergence of negative 4. So where's the image? Well, the rays of light are diverging on this side. So we have to create imaginary extensions of the rays of light back to a point of intersection on the other side of the lens. How far away is it? Take a reciprocal. 1 over 4 diopters is 0 0.25 meters or 25 centimeters away from the mirror. So the image is as far behind as the object is in front, and it's an upright image. Um, <clears throat> so, and it's a virtual image because it's imaginary extensions of the rays of light back to a point of intersection on the other side of the lens. So, what about a concave mirror, and what is the reflecting power of a mirror? Remember the refracting power of a, of a lens? Well, that, that d equals n prime minus n over r. Well, for a mirror, we have a very similar formula, actually. Well, well, first, before I say that, we'll say the reflecting power is actually just the reciprocal of the focal length of the lens. And the focal length is half the radius of curvature of the lens. So here's the Here's the radius of curvature of this particular mirror. That means the focal length is half that. <clears throat> and the power is 2 over r, 2 over the radius of curvature. Remember, d equals n prime minus n over r. But in a mirror, there's no difference in refractive index because it's just bouncing off the mirror. So n prime minus n becomes 1 minus negative 1, which ends up becoming 2 in a mirror. So 2 over r. Where do you draw a central ray when you have a curved mirror? Is it from the tip of the object through the center of the mirror? No, no, it's not. It is from the tip of the object through the center of curvature of the mirror. That's the central ray. So let's put all these things together then. Now we know the reflecting power as it relates to the center of curvature, the radius of curvature, and that the focal length is half that distance. So, so by the way, if that's the focal point of a mirror, that means if the focal point's half this distance, that means parallel rays of light coming in would be focused to this point. Or if you wanted to create a, if you wanted to create a, a flashlight, you'd put the light right here at the focal point because then the rays of light would come straight out. All right, so let's look at a, um, now in a convex mirror, the central ray again passes through the tip of the center of curvature of the mirror. So in a convex mirror, you're always going to have an upright image because it's always in here somewhere. So let's put all these together then and do a calculation. So we have a four diopter shaving mirror, and we put an object 16.7 centimeters away. Where's the image? Well, it's a four diopter shaving mirror. That means the center of curvature of the mirror is going to be 0.5 meters away because the power is 2 over r, 2 over 0 0.5 meters is 4 diopters. Okay, and so now what's the vergence of light entering that strikes the mirror? Well, we take a reciprocal. 1 over 0.167 centimeters is negative 6 diopters, so we do u plus d equals v negative six diopters plus four diopters is negative two. So the light leaving this mirror has a vergence of negative two diopters. But it's, so it's diverging light. So where's the image? We have to create imaginary extensions of the rays of light back to a point of intersection on the other side of the mirror. How far away is it? Take a reciprocal. One over two diopters is 0 0.5 meters or 50 centimeters away. Is it upright or is it inverted? Well, we draw a line. From the tip of the object, does it go through the center of the mirror? No, no. Tip of the object through the center of curvature of the mirror, 
There's our central ray. We know the image is here. We draw a line from the image location up to the central ray, and you see that the image is upright and magnified, and if it wasn't, it would be a lousy shaving mirror. Now with convex cave mirrors, they're interesting because depending on where you put the object, you can have, like I say, inverted and minified, upright and magnified. You can even end up with not just a virtual image, but a real image if you put it in just the right spot. So um, like so. So here's the object. It's just the right distance away. The rays of light here are converging, so you end up with a real image here or put the object here, you end up with a real image out there. And that's what's done here. You can astound your friends with optical magic. And I know that it's a real image because it says it right here. The real image, Mirage projects, is brilliant full of color and detail. So it's sort of projecting that image up on top of this disk, even though the marbles are down inside somewhere. Now, as an example of a convex mirror, let's consider the cornea. The cornea is a convex mirror with uh, a radius of curvature of, remember this morning we said seven millimeters, but just for this example, we're gonna say eight millimeters, seven, eight millimeters. So the reflecting power of this convex mirror is two over R, two divided by the radius of curvature or 0 0.008 meters or 250 diopters. So the cornea is a convex mirror with a power of 250 diopters, actually minus 250 because it's a convex surface. Now wait a minute, some of you are saying in the audience, I could have sworn this morning you said the cornea has a power of, of 50 diopters or 45 or 48 or something like that, but certainly not 250 diopters. But this morning we were talking about the refracting power of the cornea. What happens to light when it passes through the cornea? Now we're talking about the reflecting power of the cornea. What happens to the light that bounces off of the cornea? The refracting power is 50 diopters, but the reflecting power is 250 diopters. And we'll see later today that you can use that reflecting power to determine the radius of curvature of the cornea which in turn can then be used to calculate the refracting power of the cornea. So back to our question here. When we're looking at a, a person's corneal light reflex, where exactly is that in the eye? Is it in front of the eye? Is it on the cornea? Is it inside the eye? Well, the hand light is usually about a third of a meter away. So then the light coming in is 1 over 0.33 diopters or minus centimeters or minus three diopters, U plus D equals V, negative 350 plus negative 250 is negative 253. So, but it's diverging light, whoops, coming out. <clears throat> so where's the image? Create imagined extension of the rays of light back to a point of intersection on the other side of the mirror. How far away is it? Take a reciprocal, one over 253 diopters is 0 0.004 meters or four millimeters away. So the Cornea is locate, the cornea light reflex is actually located, when we look at a, at a patient's eye and we're looking at that corneal light reflex, it's actually behind the cornea. It's four millimeters behind the cornea. It's even behind the iris. Now what if, what if his eye was filled with blood? Would we then be able, would the corneal light reflex disappear? Well, no, it's a virtual image, so you can still, it'll still look like it's four millimeters behind the cornea, even if the eye is filled with blood with blood. This is what makes Hirschberg testing so tricky because you see as the eye rotates, it's rot the corneal light reflex is rotating on a four millimeter radius, whereas the eye itself is rotating on an eight millimeter radius. So it's not an intuitive shift of the corneal light reflex as the eye crosses inward. And then uh, the final part of this, or not the final part, but the next part of this section is prisms. And we'll talk about calibration of prisms, positioning, uh, combining prisms, we'll talk about Prentice's rule, which causes induced strabismus, image jump and image displacement, Fresnel prisms, oblique prisms, and chromatic aberrations. So a lot of different things to cover when we're talking about prisms. First rule or, or message or thing to think about in prisms is that they're it's a little funny because the prism power depends on the angle of incidence. 
This picture I took, I took two prisms that had exactly the same power. They're both 25 prism diopter prisms. But you can see that they seem to have different powers because the image is shifted over different amounts. But that's because this, this prism is in the position of minimum deviation, whereas this prism, it's obliquely positioned. So prisms have different powers depending on the angle of incidence of light coming in. And the position of minimum deviation is when the angle in equals the angle out, like so. <clears throat> Anything that deviates from that, you end up getting more prismatic deviation. You see the way a prism works. Remember back this morning or yesterday or last week or whenever it was, we talked about how light is bent towards the normal to the interface when you go from low to high refractive index and then away from the normal to the interface when you go from high to low refractive index. And with these angles configured as so, you end up with the rays of light sort of deflected towards the base as if they were sort of draped over the top of the prism. So light is deflected towards the base of a prism. When you're using prisms in the clinic, you need to position them properly or you could end up with incorrect measurements. So in this case, um, this is called the Prentice position where the, where the back surface is perpendicular to the eye. This, by putting the prism, the back of the prism in the frontal plane, that simulates the position of minimum deviation and that gives the least error when doing your measurements. So you see that if you hold, in this case, this was some numbers generated by uh, David Guyton. If you hold this prism perpendicular to the visual axis, you get a, it's, it measures 40 prism diopters, but if you hold it in the frontal plane, it measures 32. So let's say you grab a prism out of the prism box, and it's 32 prism diopter prism, and you measure, it says 32, and you do a cover test, but you actually hold it at an angle <clears throat> so that it's neutralizing 40, and you do your cover test, and now there's no shift. And you say, ah, oh, it must be, you look at the prism, you say, oh, 32 prism diopters, it must be a 32 angle. But in fact, because you had the prism tilted, you were neutralizing 40, so the true measurement was 40. But it says 32, so you operate for 32, you end up with an undercorrection. Ah, you say, this strabismus surgery, it's a bunch of witchcraft. It's, which is true, but it doesn't help matters if you're not holding the, the prism in the right way. So we want the prisms, with plastic prisms, we hold them in the frontal plane. That's the position, if this eye is exotropic, that's the position of minimum deviation. Glass prisms, you actually do hold that way, but nobody uses glass prisms these days. The, or the glass prisms you hold with the apprentice position. Now, if you're trying to combine two prisms together, you end up with more surprises. In this case, you actually end up, you've combined these two prisms and we can't see anything in there because we've ended up with total internal reflection of light. Now, what in the world is going on there? Well, what, ha what happens, and again, these are some Guyton numbers, but if you combine, say, just a five and a 40, if you stack two prisms, stack them so that they're touching each other, you end up neutralizing 58 of prism power. 40 and 10, you neutralize more than 100 prism diopters. Well, why would that be? It's just putting two prisms together. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't one plus one make two? Well, the problem is if you look at this interface and in stack prisms between prism A and B, if we blow that up, the light, this first one, yes, it's position of minimum deviation, but then the second one, you see it's a weird angle that it's coming in that's nowhere near the position of minimum deviation. That's where the problem comes from. And so in order to combine prisms, you can't stack them like this. You can't put fluid between that either because then you don't know what the power of the com combination is. What you have to do is you have to either, you, so you can't stack them like this, but if you, you, if you position them like this, then you can do that. So. Here, both prisms are in the position of minimum deviation. It takes a little dexterity, but it can be done. I've done it. Put your thumb here and one finger here and one finger here. So that's one way to find the position of minimum deviation. The other way to do it is to just put one prism over each eye and put both of them in the position of minimum deviation like this. 
But this then introduces a new problem, which is that the way that prism diopters add up, which is that if you get into bigger prism powers, they don't necessarily add up. Now, if this patient has a big deviation like this, you see there's a 50 on this side, 25 on this side, you're going to be doing big surgery. So you would actually then, you could op probably three muscle surgery. So you'd like operate this side for 50 and this side for 25. You do two muscles on this side and one on this side, you should get them close. But, but how do those add up? Well, let's look at the definition of a prism diopter to explain why one plus one, another reason why one plus one doesn't equal two when it comes to prisms. Prism diopters are a nonlinear measurement. It's a convenient way to measure prisms. You take like a laser pointer, aim it at a screen, mark, put a little mark there. Now you put the prism in place and you'll see the mark will go down, deflected towards the base by a certain number of centimeters. And if the prism is 100 centimeters from the screen and the light deflects down by 15, that's a 15 prism diopter prism. Now you may notice that I think it's, I'd like to just point out here that we're talking about centimeters here because all the day we've been talking about make sure everything's in meters before you do your calculations. But for some of the prism calculations I'm going to show you, you actually do them in centimeters. So that's 15 centimeters. What if you, what if the light was deflected down by 100 centimeters? Then that would be a 100 prism diopter prism. But if it's 100 and 100, that's a 45 degree angle. So a 45 degree angle is the same as 100 prism diopters. Okay, so that's the definition of a prism diopter. So if you have a patient who has exotropia of 45 degrees of the left eye and 45 degrees of the right eye, we know that's 100 and 100. So is the combined deviation 200 prism diopters? We know it's 90 degrees, but is it 200 prism diopters? No, it's actually infinite prism diopters. 90 degrees translates to infinite prism diopters. And why would that be? Well, here I just showed you the 45 degree angle. The light's deflected down the screen by 100 centimeters. But if the light comes in and goes at a 90 degree angle, it's going to de be deflected down. It, there, it never touches the screen. It goes all the way down, and it just never meets the screen. So a 90 degree angle is equal to an infinite number of prism diopters. And we can plot this like so looking at prism diopters per degree like this, and you see that it really is pretty much two prism diopters per degree up to about 100 or 150 prism diopters. But then it goes crazy, and it goes off to infinity once you get up to 90 degrees. So it's not that often that we're explaining to patients about their 173 prism diopter deviations. So for the most part, you can use this, and it's convenient because you can give the patient the numbers in degrees instead of prism diopters, something more relevant. Or I, I find it especially useful being a strabismus surgeon. I'll say to the family, well, before the surgery, Johnny had an exotropia of, of 30 prism diopters, but now after the surgery, it only drifts out by 15 degrees. So we've had some improvement, but we need, need to perform an enhancement. <laughs> um, actually, I've, I like that idea of enhancement, but it wasn't catching on, but I now call it an adjustment, suture adjustment. Um, so what, so, so we've, we've already said how prisms displace light towards the base, and, and so, um, and so if, 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 we, if I was to take a, a prism, and, uh, and I do this sometimes in a, in a smaller group, if I was to, to walk up to this uh, projector and take a prism and put it based down here in the pathway of light between the projector and the screen, everyone in the room would see the, the image would shift down on the screen. The, the, whole, the whole image of the slide would shift down on the screen. But the funny thing is that if I, instead of that, if I handed each one of you a prism and had you put it base down over your eyes, the image would actually appear to shift, the image of the screen would actually appear to shift up instead of down, like this. So why, why would that be? In each case, whether it's in the path of light to the projector or in the path of light from the screen to the eye, in each case, the light is still deflected toward the base, but when you're viewing through a prism, you're seeing a virtual image. We have imaginary extensions of the rays of light here. And so the virtual image 
appears to shift towards the apex while the real image, while the real image is displaced towards the base. So this can become a clinical um, issue. Let's take a, a subject who has straight eyes. So this person has straight eyes and we're gonna introduce prism, because I'm gonna come back over here again. We're gonna introduce prism in front of his right eye. What kind of a strabismus does that induce in his case? Is it a, hyper, is it a right hypertropia or a right hypotropia? <clears throat> well, when you look at this slide, your first instinct is to say, oh, well, the eye looks like it's lower, so it must be a hypotropia. But let's think about it a little bit more carefully than that. First of all, if we look at the corneal light reflex, you'll see that it's actually now displaced downward inside of the pupil, which suggests that the eye is looking upward. <clears throat> okay, that's one way to look at it. So that's telling us maybe it's a right hypertropia. Another thing is, if we put base up prism in front of the right eye, how would you fix that? You'd fix it with base down prism over the right eye, but you know from your clinical experience, if you, have, if you do this, that base down prism is gonna correct a, a right hypertropia. Another way to think of it is, imagine that there's a little man standing inside of the eye pointing a laser pointer straight at you. So this left one's gonna come straight at you. And now there's another little man inside this eye and it was pointing a laser pointer straight at you, so it was coming towards you, but then this base up prism intervened, and so what happens? The light's deflected towards the base. So the light coming out towards you gets deflected up toward the base. So it's a right hypertropia. Now don't confuse yourself by thinking about what's the patient gonna do to try to fuse. I'm just saying the patient, if you just do cover testing in this case, you're gonna measure a right hypertropia because the light that's coming out of this eye would be deflected up towards the base. Now, <clears throat> and you'll see later why we're going through this exercise, not too much later. And so that's a right hypertropia. There's now lenses, while lenses can reflect, refract light, they also have prismatic power of their own. And that can lead to some trouble sometimes in patients. And the amount of prism that a lens induces is determined by Prentice's rule. Delta equals H times D. H is the displacement away from the optical center of the lens in centimeters. D is the power of the lens in diopters. I don't like it when people say, describe uh, strabismic deviations in diopters because it confuses me. I like prism diopters for prismatic deviations and diopters for lens deviations to keep it completely clear. So delta equals H in centimeters times D in diopters. Uh, that's how much prism power you induce. And what kind of prism? Is it base up or base down? Well, it depends on where the optical center is. Now, what I'm showing here is the geometric center of the lens which is just determined by drawing a box around the eye and the center of the box is the geometric center. But that has nothing to do with the optical center of the lens. The optical center could be anywhere and you find it by putting the lens in the, uh, a lens without prism in the lens meter and moving it around till there's no deflection of light. The optical center in that previous picture would be right here where the dotted line is. That's the optical center where there's no prismatic power a plus lens then we can think of with this visual mnemonic. It's acting like two prisms that are base to base. A minus lens we can think of as acting like two prisms that are apex to apex. So if we're below the optical center of a plus lens, we end up with base up prism. Below the optical center of a minus lens, we end up with base down prism and vice versa for above. So we can see that in this picture, this images of a minus lens and you see that there's the image is displaced so a minus lens is like prisms apex to apex so the image of the side of the head is displaced toward the apex whereas this plus lens is like prisms base to base so the image of the side of the head is displaced toward the apex which is out here now vertical you can also end up with vertical prisms like so and um, uh, Connie West was telling me about a, a patient who was referred to her to clear the eye after, um, uh, after, tr uh, 
after trauma because he was seeing double after he had had some trauma to the eye and there was a non-displaced orbital fracture and the surgeon was taking the patient for, to surgery because of the double vision because obviously he had an entrapped muscle even though ocular motility was full. And it turned out that the trauma had also bent his glasses like so and given him a vertical strabismus. And she just uh, took the glasses and, and bent them back into place, put them back on, cured the double vision, and spared the patient from uh, surgery. Now, plus lenses can exaggerate the strabismic deviation, but not in the way you might think. Here are some very strong plus lenses, and it's making the patient look isotropic and because it, it magnifies the eye, and so it's going to make the cosmetic deviation, whatever it is, worse. But what does it do to the measured deviation? Opposite of what you would think. Here's big, strong plus lenses, plus 10, in front of a patient who's exotropic. We know he has, a, we're given that he has a 40 prism diopter exotropia, but you see the eye now, the, the optical pathway is going away from the center of the lens, so he's experiencing some base in prism, which reduces the amount of exotropia. And if you do the math, it turns out it reduces it to 30 prism diopters. Whereas a patient who has, and now if the patient has esotropia, he's going to get base out prism, which again is going to actually, is going to reduce the amount of measured esotropia. And so with high plus lenses, you reduce, the measured deviation is less than what you might, um, than what it, than the true deviation. And in contrast, with minus lenses, you get an increase in the measured deviation instead of the true deviation. And the formula is 2.5% times D, where D is the spectacle power. So these are plus 10 lenses, so it's a 25% increase in the measured deviation for myop decrease in deviation for hyperopia, the mnemonic there is minus measures more. So do you use this? Do we use this clinically? Well, you at least consider it clinically. Yet another reason why I tend to use adjustable sutures in complicated patients, but, um, but, the, uh, but it is at least something to consider when um, uh, doing your, your strabismus surgery. I think that it may be negated in part because the minus lenses decrease the cosmetic deviation and make it harder to see your endpoint for cover testing. So here's a patient, he has these strong minus lenses, and that's really all you can see, but when he takes the glasses off, then you see that he actually has uh, an esotropia. But it measures, it looks like less here, but it measures more with the glasses on. So the effective deviation is increased by the minus DV lenses, but the cosmetic deviation is decreased by minus lenses. So this brings us then to a, to a, a favorite um, question, um, and that is that a patient comes into the office after cataract surgery, and um, well, you know, your post-op result maybe wasn't quite what you wanted here, plus one, plus three to 90, and in addition, he's seeing double when he tries to read. What, what's going on here? <clears throat> well, let's think about the prismatic effect in reading position in this patient. We're gonna then look at this in each of these lenses separately. One, diet, one centimeter below the optical center. The right lens first, minus three sphere. We're below the optical center, so we're getting base down prism. How much? Delta equals H times D is one centimeter times three diopters is three prism diopters of base down prism on the right. Left eye, well left eye we need to know just the power in the vertical meridian, so we need to do a power cross. We have our shortcut where we know the plus one is gonna go on the 90 degree meridian. We know it's gonna be plus four on the 180, but that doesn't matter. So all you care about is the plus one in the 90 degree meridian. So it's one centimeter times one diopter is one prism diopter, but this is a plus lens, so it's base up prism. So you've got three base down on the right, one base up on the left. Now to those do those cancel each other out or do they add up? Well, if he had three base down on both sides, he wouldn't have any strabismus. He'd just have some image um, dislocation. So these add up and cause more difference between the eyes. So it's a total of four prism diopters of prism power 
in the reading position that he experiences, and this is what's causing his double vision. So what can we do about that? Can we, oh, and what kind of, is it a hyper or a right hypo again? Well, it's three base down on the right. Let, let's think of it as four base down on the right. So if you've got base down prism on the right, then the little man shining his laser pointer from the fovea out to the world, it's gonna experience base down prism, so the light's gonna be deflected downward. So it's gonna be a right hypotropia or a left hypertropia. So this patient then, in the reading position, experiences a left hypertropia of four prism diopters. So what to do about it? Do you just prescribe four of prism? Just write four base, you know, four base down on the left, say? Well, no, you can't do that because that works for reading position, but now he'll see double when he's looking straight ahead. So we have a problem because it's a difference in different positions of gaze. So you could say, oh, now we'll get fancy and we'll move the optical centers down to the reading position. But if you move them all the way down to the reading position, then again, you got the same problem straight ahead. You could move them maybe halfway down and hope you get lucky, that that'll be tolerable prism in the two different positions. Or you could prescribe, you could give contact lenses, of course, or partially lower the optical centers, or you could give slab off prism. So slab off prism is a different kind of a grinding. This is an example of glasses that have had prism power just taken off the bottom part of the lens, slab off power. And the way that works is that it's just taken off the more minus lens, you can give the amount, it's a separate grinding center, and, um, and this can, can help the patients have no strabismus in reading position or in straight ahead gaze. And <clears throat> this may sound like a theoretical problem, but it's a real problem. Here's a live actual patient who had it. I've treated a few patients, diagnosis in a few patients, including one who'd had you know, a, a CT and an MRI and an, and an MRA and a pet, CAT scan and a PET scan and then his pet had a CAT scan. And, um, so, so uh, but it turned out that he just, he had, he'd had double vision ever since his cataract surgery. He had um, strabismus in the reading position. So um, most patients will adapt or learn to fuse some amount of it, but you may have to give some slab off prism. So what a great question to ask, though, if you think about it, if you want an efficient question. Because here, you've got to, what do you have to know to answer this question? First, you have to be able to know this, the you know, Prentice's rule to calculate the prism power off center. Second is, you have to be able to do the power cross thing to figure out just what's in the vertical uh, lens power. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, what's, what's in vertical versus horizontal meridian. Third is you have to be able to figure out what induced prism, you know, what kind of strabismus is created when you introduce prism in front of the eye. Um, fourth is you have to know what to do about it and how to, you know, how to actually treat with slab off prism. Um, so it's a very efficient question because it requires a lot of knowledge of different things in optics to be able to get to the end. So next I wanted to talk about image jump and image displacement. And, it, and it's, um, <clears throat> it's always a little hard for me to, to talk about this because I think it's less clinically um, important than some of the other issues, but still worth at least addressing briefly because it can come up. So image jump is what happens when the visual axis crosses into the bifocal. And it depends on the style of the bifocal. Whereas image displacement is what happens in the reading position once the eyes have settled into the reading position. And it's a combined effects of the lens and the segment. So what exactly do I mean by image jump? It's the sudden introduction of prismatic power at the top of the bifocal segment, right there. It's just as you cross that line, the image will seem to jump. And it's worse the further you are from the optical center. So these round top bifocal segments are gonna give you maximum image jump. Whereas a flat top segment gives you minimal image jump and an executive segment, the optical centers align, there's no image jump here. Progressive bifocals too would have no image jump. So it has nothing to do with whether it's a hyperope or myope, it's all to do with the design of the segment. On the other hand, for image displacement, 
we have to think about what happens in the reading position. And a flat top segment is going to act like a base up prism in reading position, whereas a round top is going to act like a base down in reading position. So that the net deviation, if you have a plus lens and a round top, you got base up on the plus lens, base down on the, on the bifocal, those cancel each other out. So there's minimal image displacement. Oops. <clears throat> on the other hand, plus lens and a flat top, both of them are base up prisms, so you're going to get a lot of image displacement in reading position. In myopic patients, it's the opposite. Base, round top, you get a lot of image displacement because you got base down, base down, but flat top, you got base down, base up. Those cancel each other out, so there's not much image displacement. So for the myope, the decision about round top versus flat top is easy because image jump is less through the flat top, image displacement is left through the combination. So flat tops are always going to be better for a myopic patient. Hyperopic patients, you have to decide. Image displacement is better through the flat top, through the round top. Image jump is better through the flat top. So what matters more to a patient? Well, as far as I'm concerned, if, if somebody is bothered by, you know, if they say it bothers me when I do this, then I would say, don't do that. Right? I mean, what, why is image jump is just not going to be that much of a clinical issue for most patients. Whereas image displacement, if they're a nuclear power plant operator and they reach to push the shutdown button, they may end up hitting the meltdown button. So, you know, all of humanity may be riding on your shoulders if you prescribe the wrong bifocals to a nuclear power plant operator, giving them too much image displacement uh, in reading position. That said, the fact is that flat top segments are ubiquitous, they're e cheaper, they're easier to, to give, and so most hyperopic patients still end up with flat top segments, and few, if any, will complain. But you do need to know, uh, just in case that, um, that one patient comes across your, your office <clears throat> who's having trouble. Fresnel prisms can be, uh, <clears throat> are also known as press-on prisms. They're, um, they're, uh, uh, Fresnel figured out that instead of one big prism like this, if you have a whole bunch of prisms, one next to the other, you can still get that same prismatic power. You can get them up to 40 prism diopters. Um, they're relatively convenient compared to ground-in prisms and certainly more lightweight, but they're not perfect. They're difficult to clean, and all, these little, all this little diffraction and chromatic aberration gives you glare and, and reduced visual acuity. But in the office, you know, something like this, patient comes in with a new onset small angle strabismus, um, you can slap the Fresnel prism on there and send them home with, with single vision. And it can be very satisfying as a short-term solution, at least, for many patients. <clears throat> when you have, when you're prescribing Fresnel prisms, there may come a time when the patient has both vertical and horizontal deviations. And you have to know, you have to know trigonometry to be able to calculate it. But one other way that Dave Guyton taught me is that you can measure the, if you have, say, five up and eight out, you can take a ruler, measure five this way, eight this way, then cut it out, and you can measure the angle in the trial frame and give your uh, prism. You can stick on your oblique prism in that way. The power is this length, and the angle is what's shown there. When you are prescribing prisms, though, you do have to be, especially if you're prescribing a Fresnel prism, if you don't stick it on yourself, you see that if you say seven prism diopters base 135, there, there's actually a 135 here and a 135 here. So you have to say seven base down and out in the 135 degree meridian, or seven base up and in in the 135 meridian. Uh, if you're prescribing ground in prisms, you don't have to do any of the trigonometry. You just say you know eight base up and five base out over the left eye, and okay to divide prism between eyes, and uh, and that will um, be enough. That's obviously a different prescription. Fi uh, and then finally, with regard to prisms, we have they induce chromatic effects as well. And I think, uh, yeah, once we're done with this, we'll break for lunch. We'll probably break for lunch. So I could just go all day without even taking a single break, but you know it's, it's okay. We'll we'll stop. So. 
prism, prisms have chromatic effects. That is, remember discussion of refractive index has to do with how much the light slows, but different wavelengths will slow the light different amounts. And so white light is dispersed by, for this reason, where blue is bent most and red. The red rays, they're sort of more, they're the longer wavelength and they just sort of cruise through and don't get deflected as much, whereas the high intensity blue short wavelength gets, gets deflected more. So blue is bent the most. Um, thus you get all the colors of the rainbow when you pass white light through a prism. And that's all very pretty, but it can cause problems in the eye because not only do prisms cause have chromatic aberration, but lenses do as well, such that blue rays of light are focused closer to the lens than red rays of light. Blue rays of light come to focus sooner than red rays, and that means that you can get chromatic aberration in the eye. And it actually is, if you model it, it's pretty significant. It's the three diopter difference between the ends of the spectrum from blue to red. Um, it, it's, uh, although it's fairly significant, it's, it's not really, we're, we're, we're sort of adjusted to it and so it doesn't disturb our lives for the most part. And we can actually use it in the red-green test, which doesn't use a three diopter difference. You take filters and create a chromatic spherical difference of 0 0.5 diopters. So the duochrome or red-green test looks something like this. You have black letters on red and green backgrounds, and you adjust the sphere until the letters are equally clear on both sides. And what that means is that the red rays are as far behind the retina as the green rays are as in front, and that puts yellow light in perfect focus on the eye, which is optimal for viewing in white light. We generally start from the fog direction. That is, you give too much plus at first, you make the red clearer, and then when they say the red's clear, that means they want more red, so you give them more minus. So the advantage of this is, I don't personally use this because I'm just very stingy about giving minus power. I'll start with too much plus and then I won't give the next minus unless they can actually read more letters. However, if you're doing multi-center studies of say refractive surgery, we have where refractive refraction is the outcome, this is one way to control it from many sites. And, and many clinicians do swear by this test as a great way to control for accommodation. So to review then what we've covered in other optics of note, we've covered magnification and low vision, how they work together, mirrors, and quite an extensive uh, part of prisms. And what we'll be talking about next will be uh, the most practical aspects of optics, including instruments and how we use them, prescribing tricks, and then optics in the office, that is what patients will present with and how you would approach and manage those patients.